Paul Pierce was one of the NBA's rising stars. But a violent bar brawl nearly ended it all. I'm just saying to myself, you know, I hope I don't die. Beyond the Glory, next on Fox Sports Net. in the NBA with the truth. But that's the one thing Paul Pierce may never find out. The knife wound came within an inch of several vital organs. There was no rhyme or reason for this to happen. Paul did nothing wrong. There were many, many people there that night, many of whom who have yet to come forward today. Go investigate, find out who's bragging about something. Maybe they'll come up with something. You know, when I'm out there and I got the ball, everything else goes out the window. I'm out here by myself, and this is my peace of mind. This is Paul Pierce. Beyond the glory. there for me. I'm young. I'm doing what I want to do. He had the game. He was living the life. In 2000, the Celtics young gun set his sights on the Fleet Center rafters, high above that old parquet floor. My third year, you know, I'm going to come out and show everybody, show the world what I got now. It's time to unleash the dragon. for the truth. What had happened to Paul Pierce? We just wanted to go out and hang, um, enjoy a little music, you know, nice crowd or whatever. Let's get out, you know, let's just have some fun while we can before camp starts. September 24th, 2000, Tony and Derek Batie picked up Paul for a late night party at a night spot known as the Buzz Club. That was the club that, you know, I feel like changed my life forever. ladies in there, you know, I stop, I say hi, and then next thing you know, I'm in the mix with somebody. Some guy just runs up, you know, some regular club goal, and he's like, Paul was just in a fight. And we're thinking like, what? You know, everything is happening so fast that, you know, I can't even tell you how long it lasted. I immediately just said, Tony, we gotta get him out of here. I picked Paul up in my arms, just like 
you know, a baby, and I, and I carried him out of that club and put him in the car. He's talking to us like, you know, nothing, nothing's wrong, you know, he's cleaning up his face, you know. When he leaned up, from the headrest all the way down his back, my whole seat was, set, was just drenched with blood. He had been stabbed at least eight times. breathing and there's blood everywhere I hope I don't lose too much blood to where you know I die in the chaos outside the club the Batie brothers began screaming for a hospital we wasn't familiar with the area and it was real hectic it was a chaotic three minutes we're racing down a one-way street uh, I'm dodging cars, trying to get there as soon as I can. As soon as we hit the corner, there's a children's hospital that had a big hospital sign, so we just follow on the sign. We don't know where the entrance is. Put up to the fir first door, it's locked. Another door is a couple steps down. So we started headed up to the emergency. We got halfway, I couldn't make it. I'm like, Derek, you know, I'm, I'm looking at him like, man, I can't walk no more. A security guard alerted the emergency room just a few feet away. They kind of just rushed us out all in a, in a frantic pace, like, OK, we'll take it from here. And I remember the last thing he said on the elevator as we were going up the elevator to the surgery was like, can you get my arm, D? I said, you're going to be like a ghost. My phone kept ringing. It was early. It was early in the morning, like 6, 6, I don't know, 5. News of the incident, what little there was, reached the West Coast before dawn. My wife heard it first, and she was crying. She said, your mom said Paul's got stabbed. I said, no, it couldn't be. It just hit me hard, man. It hit me hard. I thought my friend was gone, you know. If not for an extraordinary set of circumstances, he almost certainly would be. He was blessed by a chain of events. Being close to the hospital. Just 20 feet from the Buzz Club entrance was a parking sign for the New England Medical Center. Luckily, the hospital was like no more than like one minute away, right down the street. Then there's the leather jacket. You know, those West Coast guys ain't used to this weather out here. So when he came, he didn't have no jackets. So when he went down to the, to the thing, he bought all these leather jackets with Averex and these big patches on them. God, the jacket saved his life. <laughs> He had a number of superficial wounds to his back and his abdomen. And in the absence of the leather jacket, all of those could have done much more damage than they did. Only one wound was potentially lethal. The knife was thrust seven inches into his body, stopping just short of his heart. The incredible route that a knife took to slip right past a spleen, puncture a diaphragm, puncture a lung, miss the heart. In the abdominal cavity, it came within an inch of his spleen and within an inch of his liver. Just slid right in between them and just was looking at my heart like that. Close as you can get. We believe that he was stabbed by one black male. Some members of the local music group or rap group may have been involved in this. These individuals may be dangerous. They persist in talking about made men as being responsible. Unbelievable shot, Paul Pierce. And sometimes the truth hurts. We're really not comfortable in commenting at a, on a motive. That particular night, it was a group of guys that I guess just really had it in for, for Paul for whatever reason. What did I do you know, to deserve this? September 25th, 2000. Paul Pierce lies in critical condition after being stabbed at least eight times in a Boston nightclub. The doctor says, you're going to be all right. And I'm like, am I going to live? I just want to make it through this. You know, am I going to live? Am I going to live?
coming from Inglewood and some of the problems that we have there, I'm thinking he made it all the way through here. Now you go out to Boston and this happens there. Detective Scott Collins was ready to offer his help in the investigation. As a patrol officer in Inglewood, California, 15 years earlier, he met a young boy who would change his life. He was kind of a chubby kid at that time, but he could always shoot the ball. Collins was a part-time coach in the Police Activity League. They were leagues for inner-city kids that really didn't have the funds to play in other, other basketball leagues. Coach Collins been the father figure not only to me, but a lot of kids growing up. Paul never really knew his own father. Lorraine Hosey let him keep his father's surname. The full-time nurse left her past in Oakland when she moved her children south in 1986. We knew that he was going to play something, football, baseball, basketball, but we didn't know what. Paul's older brothers, Jamal and Steven, had both gone to college on athletic scholarships. In Inglewood, Paul was on his own for the first time in his life. Coming from Oakland, you know, when the other guys come up to you and say, you know, hey, what's up, what's up, how you doing, partner? They say, hey, what's up, blood, meaning, like, what's up, homeboy, like, how you doing? And I'm over here meeting new friends, and I'm like, hey, what's going on, blood? And they looking at me funny, and I'm like, you know, this is like, I don't know nothing about Crips and Bloods at the time. We have our share of gangs in Inglewood um, and a lot of violent crimes. I've been on the bus line going to school where kids have pulled out guns. It's tough being on your own. Like so many single moms, Lorraine relied on sports to help keep her youngest child out of trouble. As far as we were younger, that's all we did was walk around with balls in our hands. Sometimes forget about eating. You know, we're on the court playing. Just blocks away from their favorite playground. Magic and his gang were making NBA history. Saves it from Magic Johnson and a brilliant play by Jake Corbin. Me and my friends would go up there sometimes and we find ways to sneak into the forum. Sometimes I would help them get in. For overtime pay, Collins worked security at the Great Western Forum. On this play. A lot of times, you know, they'd want to go to the game, so I'd try to get a few tickets for a couple of young men to go to the game and, and see. The Celtics, I hated growing up. I mean, you had respect, but you hated them. So, and I'm sure it's the same way in Boston with the Lakers, probably. Paul, like most playground players in Inglewood at the time, believed he was the next coming of Magic Johnson. But by high school, his game was at a crossroads. To come to Inglewood High School and play basketball means a lot to a lot of different kids. Um, we've had over 70 young men try out for every level. It's a tough place to come and play. In 1992, Patrick Roy was 22 in his first year as head coach at Englewood High. Paul was a pudgy sophomore sharpshooter. My coach used to always say, you know, you slow as molasses. Paul was actually going to get cut. Um, he tried out for the team. We kept him around for a while, and, and I was definitely on the verge of cutting him. That's Crow just outside the three-point circle. Inside pass to Pierce. It's no good. It came to one tournament. It was like a Christmas tournament we all played in, and I think only like seven guys showed up. So I had no other alternative but to play Paul. That's Pierce, and Pierce thought he had found a home over there. He's settling in and shooting another three! Paul stepped into the lineup from there, and he never got out. He just had a certain magic to his game already then. And a steal by Pierce. This young man is playing a ball game. By Paul Pierce. Young man, looks like he's going to be a real comer for the Sentinels through the season as well as the next couple of seasons. The next year, Paul's body developed along with his game. He led Inglewood High to 30 wins and a division title. He really made me, as a coach, made me what I am today. By his senior year, 
Paul was rated the top prospect in the state. I saw him play more than anybody in the world. You know, his mom probably saw him play just as much, but there's no coach that saw him play more than I saw him. Kansas coach Roy Williams distinguished himself from the rest of Paul's recruiters in one other way. He didn't promise me anything. He said, you know, you're going to go here, you're going to work just like everybody else, I'm going to stay on you. We tried to sell him on the idea he could be the missing piece to the puzzle, but that he had to earn it. That was enough for me. He left for Lawrence, Kansas in the fall of 95. I felt like I was ready to go away to be a man. He got out there, he said, man, it's nothing out here. First time in snow, he didn't have a jacket. You know, like, man, I'm from California, you know, it's, it's snowing out here. But the little campus on the Great Plains of Kansas holds a shrine to the game where Paul Pierce would feel right at home. Oh, Pierce! There it is, the Pierce! The bigger the game, the better he played. Here's Pierce to the other end, he hesitates, he shoots, he scores! The amazing As a sophomore, seven, Paul was the second leading scorer on a dominant team. Denied. Devon out to Pierce for a long three. They had Ray for friends, they had Paula, they had Jacques Vaughn at the point, they had Paul, so they were a great basketball team. Kansas would lose only one regular season game, a double overtime heartbreaker at Missouri. Had it. Missouri gets it! The Jayhawks were the consensus pick to win it all and give Roy Williams his first national title. And he plays into Pierce, who goes to the goal and stuffed it. He's Unlike the NBA, where it's a playoff system and generally talent prevails, this is a game of one and out, and uh, they went down. And we're a little bit disappointed, but um, I'm not going to hold my head down and... Um... If I coach another 20 years, uh, I'll always remember that team and the, the pain I felt and still feel that that team didn't get a chance to go to the Final Four. Just three years later, the men who helped shape Paul's career would find themselves praying for his life. After watching the, this young man blossom, I was very, very afraid. I panicked. It was the worst scenario. I mean, it's just, it was, I still can't describe the feeling. Being in my line of work, I mean, you don't like getting calls at that time, and we know it's not, usually not a good call. It's scary, very scary. franchises. We got the greatest steal probably in the history of the draft. But a case could be made that he never should have come to Boston in the first place. junior year at Kansas. He was considered a top five draft pick. A lot of times I'd look and I'd say, that guy can't guard him. And uh, I would, I would yell, take him. But I'm not sure I've ever done it to anyone else. He's the best scorer uh, that I've ever had. At his final home game that year, even the Kansas faithful could sense the future. It was a national televised game. I must have reeled off like 16 or 17 straight points. He's in a zone right now. I think he could put a blindfold on him. It was so crazy. The crowd was chanting, one more year, one more year. Kelvin Sampson, Oklahoma's coach, stood up and said, no, no. Good evening, C. 
Samson was right. And welcome to the 1998 NBA I was in the green room. I'm in the room with all the other lottery picks. Before the draft even starts, everybody's kind of relaxing around, but once it starts, it's kind of a hush. You can feel the tension in there. With the first pick in the 1998 They start calling off names, and they didn't call Paul's name one. They didn't call him two. We just like holding our breath every time they call out a new name. When the third pick came up, there was a camera at our table and a camera at Ray LaFrance's table. The Denver Nuggets select Ray LaFrance from the University of Kansas. We thought he would go two or three in the draft, and he's slipping, and then all of a sudden, we're all trying to gather information to say what's wrong with him. With the fourth, with the fifth pick, the as it went to fifth pick, sixth pick, seventh pick, we're saying there's no chance. There's no chance that this is going to happen. With the ninth pick in the 1998 NBA draft. When I'm looking over at my brother, looking over at Scott, looking over at my mom, you know, nobody knows what's going on. You feel embarrassed, like, hey, what did I do wrong? The reason his stock dropped down was really out of shape. The one the source said he was soft. I was there to work out. I was an eyewitness. You know, everywhere he went, he just shot the ball lights out. And when we realized that Paul had dropped to us, we just went crazy. We just started all yelling. The waiting game would end at 10. With the 10th pick in the 1998 NBA draft, the Boston Celtics select Paul Pierce. I went back to my room that night and cried. I said, what happened? Sometimes it comes down to teams uh, picking by position. Those other teams were either going to go point guard or go real big. I told him, I said, hey, Paul, you're back in the green and white, just like at Inglewood. So nothing changes. On the court, not much did. Paul Pierce has taken command. His game is at another level. Right Started out really fast. You know, I ended up getting rookie of the month the first month. Number 34 began his professional career as a role player under Rick Pitino. I'm kind of intimidated by the guy. He has one of those voices, you know, where he kind of scares you. Despite Paul's play and Patino's enthusiasm, the young Celtics were often outmanned and overwhelmed. In college, I probably lost a total of, what, 11 games at most. And then I come to the Celtics, and in my first, what, three weeks, we go on a nine-game losing streak, and I'm like, Man, this is tough. Yeah, Reed steps to this one. No, back rims it right there. Pierce, and he may have turned an ankle. A severe ankle sprain would nag him the rest of his rookie season. That fall, the 21-year-old would realize just how far from Inglewood he had come. He and fellow rookie Sharif Abdur Rahim flew to Taiwan to teach basketball clinics as part of the Nike Hoops Tour. When I got to the airport, they had people out there asking for autographs. They had my basketball card. I felt like the president. You know, more people recognized me overseas than they did at home. He returned to Boston in September with a new sense of celebrity. Just days later, calamity struck in his wake. You know, a big earthquake, people die, buildings, you know, get torn up. I'm thinking somebody, you know, was watching over me. If I was over there, you know, a couple days longer, well, there'd be no, you know, Paul Pierce in the NBA today. Pierce. His second season began just weeks later. Paul was determined to play to his potential. It was his time to run his own show. He filled the shoes and he stepped up. He and forward Antoine Walker gave Celtics fans everywhere hope for the future. Boston again missed out on the postseason, but the foundation for a return to glory was in place. I remember the next draft. We really weren't too excited about it. We were at a workout facility, and I looked out, and it was Paul working out for about an hour. And I said, we don't have to worry about this draft. Our answer's right there on the floor. September 2000, the Celtics' young stars host a ticket drive. Both players and fans are anxious to start the season. I worked so hard that summer. Now it's time to unleash the dragon. We just want to go out 
hang, enjoy a little music. Let's just have some fun while we can before camp starts. He was in pretty rough shape when he was wheeled in the door. The emergency staff at New England Medical Center debated cutting open Paul's chest to determine the damage. A midline incision from stem to stern, allowing us to look at all the organs, put our hands in, feel things, and make sure that there's no other injuries. The procedure could have hospitalized Paul for six weeks or more. Instead, they chose a relatively new procedure, laparoscopic surgery, sending a tiny scope into Paul's body through his belly button. We were actually able to take the camera and go right up into his chest cavity and inspect his lungs, and inspect the bottom surface of his heart, and also make sure that those were not injured. Had he gone to a different hospital that night, the less invasive treatment may not have been an option. Everything was right there for Paul, and I thank God for that. As doctors worked to save Paul's life, Boston police began a baffling investigation. The attempted murder of a local hero. Here we have a very serious and brutal, some would say savage assault, and nobody from the nightclub, no employee, no uh, bouncer, no uh, bartender, or anyone associated with the Buzz Club contacted the police. I think there's a lot of people who know what happened. I guess you could take it from a government standpoint and say they've been threatened or they're in fear of their lives. After being stabbed to within an inch of his heart, Paul Pierce walked out of the New England Medical Center on his own. I can't wait to get back out on the basketball court and join my Celtic teammates. 24 hours earlier, Boston police issued arrest warrants for three men. A lot of it was simply old-fashioned police work and following leads. Fortunately, uh, some people did come forward, and from there we were able to identify those we believe were responsible for this crime. I recognize uh, a couple of the photographs. Paul identified William Ragland. He and another suspect, Trevor Watson, worked security for a local rap group known as Made Men. Five months earlier, a member of the group was stabbed during a backstage brawl at a rap concert at the Fleet Center. Two members had been murdered over the group's 15-year history. Founder Ray Scott has had several brushes with Boston police. If they don't have any clues with it's just easy to say made men, or it's easy to, for somebody to say uh, made men. Scott and his lawyer appeared on the local news the day after the stabbing. It was crowded, so you know there was fists flying and stuff like that. I really didn't, you know, it was dark and they were real dark. I just, you know, left. He's done very well. He is a pod owner of the Source magazine, which is the largest hip-hop magazine in the world. Paul also identified Anthony Hurston, who was employed by the Source. I want to send my, you know, definitely regrets for what happened to Paul Pierce and his family. And that comes from me and everybody that, that, that you know, is down with, you know, the made men. I want to make it clear that in this case involving Paul Pierce and in those prior cases, their affiliation with the rap group Made Men made no difference to us. <laughs> Remarkably, Paul rejoined his teammates on October 3rd, 2000, five days after leaving the hospital. We don't ask him about it. We don't talk about it. It's like it never happened to us. He has a great spirit. I mean, you'll be surprised at um, the attitude that he has in the situation. His heart and his drive for the game, he wanted to be there. He wanted to be around the guys, you know. I remember the doctors saying, we do not want Paul to be putting his hands above his head. 
the day they said that to me, I looked out of the office, and Paul was down in front of the basket shooting. That same week, just miles away, the district attorney's office began presenting its case to a grand jury. The grand jury is a secretive body, it exists in every county in America. They listen to evidence to determine whether or not probable cause exists to charge certain people for a crime. The government for the Boston police uh, had a witness almost immediately. She told the police that she observed uh, William Raglan and Trevor Watson, each with a knife and stabbing Paul Pierce. A second witness identified Hurston as the man who smashed a champagne bottle across Paul's temple. Nearly two years would pass before the three men were tried in court. Right now, I'm just trying to put it behind me and uh, focus on basketball. You know, that's my main focus. That's what I came to Boston to do, and that's what I want to do. Two weeks after the attack, Paul celebrated his 23rd birthday by playing in a full contact scrimmage. Unfortunate things happen in life. Sometimes you don't try to figure things out. You put the past behind you, you forget about it, and you get on with the present and the future. Our relationship with Coach Patino definitely grew a lot closer. I lost a player um, at Boston University of an enlarged heart. I, I've lost, obviously, a, a, an infant son. And, and so when I realized I almost lost Paul Pierce as a, as a young man, someone who had all his dreams in this game almost come to an end really bothered me. Patino hired round-the-clock security for his recovering star. With the season opener just days away, the Reverend Al Sharpton held a press conference accusing police of racial profiling. You do not grab anyone around because they fit a certain stereotype or certain profile and use the hysteria of an outrageous act to pinpoint and prosecute people based on their profile rather than evidence. I felt like the basketball court was, is my peace of mind. He started the 2000 season as if nothing had ever happened, but his coach was wary. You don't know what's going through his mind. Is there somebody in the stands out to get me? I told Paul, if he ever has any fears, I'll trade him. You know, you can't run from, you know, what's going to happen to you. The decision for me to want to stay with the Celtics was, you know, the fan support, just knowing that I had people who had my back, that I really had, you know, really wanted to support me through this. Alley up to Pierce, and he puts it in. Number 34 would be the only Celtic that year to start all 82 games. Pierce off the oh, hello. Anthony gets it quickly to Osmond. And Pierce the quick hands to take it away. Pierce the nice move. The but his biggest fan would be gone by midseason. I said in the beginning that come next year, if this team doesn't reach its potential, doesn't make the playoffs, I would definitely make a move on myself. He just gave me a big hug and he said, I'm sorry I let you down. And um, I said, well, sh I said, you're the one guy never let me down, Paul. There hasn't been a period in my life where I've been as upset as this, as this. Paul would put all the turmoil of several anxious months behind him and unleash the dragon as promised. Oh, here's the two. And that much defense. <laughs> here's again doing all this stuff with a body that was not as strong as it would be normally. And he was still really turning it on. In March, he scored 40 points four times in a seven-game stretch, including a 42-point outburst in his hometown, prompting Shaquille O'Neal to pull aside a newspaper reporter. Shaquille O'Neal said Paul Pierce is the truth. <laughs> Shaq is the godfather, you know, he's the godfather of the league. Who's going to argue with Shaq? That summer, the truth signed a six-year, $90 million deal to stay in Boston. It's one of the biggest days of my life. I feel like uh, I'm back at the draft or, uh, you know, one of my first games. 
but the truth about what happened the previous September was suddenly more in question than ever before. I was convinced in my investigation that neither Raglan Paul Watson was involved in the stabbing. Defense attorney Martin Lepo was visited by the prosecution's star witness in July. She stated to me uh, that she had lied to the police. She said that Trevor did not have a knife. I don't think Raglan was involved in any more than throwing a punch at Pierce. I honestly believe that. With a legal showdown looming, Paul Pierce would help put Boston back into contention. In 2002, the Celtics made the playoffs for the first time in seven years. The remarkable run would end in the Eastern Conference Finals, but not before Paul made his comeback complete. Seven turnovers for the Boston Celtics. Right off the bat, the Celtics are in trouble. I was Game three against the New Jersey Nets. They were laughing at us, just out there having a grand old time. And the Celtics hearing some booze from the crowd. I'm like, that's not supposed to go on. I hear it, not in our house. Walker let the team have it and also let Pierce have it. Antoine was a heck of a lot more vocal uh, than I was. It wasn't polite. I said, I don't know if we're going to win this game, but we got to show them going to the game for that we're a real team. Paul Pierce is on fire, and he owns the fourth quarter. The Celtics are responsible. Started chipping away at it, you know. Went from 30 down to 20. Pierce, nice quick move. 20 down to 15. This building ready to explode. 15 down to 10. Scott has watched his net blow at 26 points. Now we got the momentum going our way. Celtics' only lead of this game was 1 0. They hit the opening free throw. The truth would score 18 points in the final 12 minutes of the greatest fourth quarter comeback in NBA playoff history. Celtics lead. We could have easily packed it in. We could have said, okay, you know, we're going to play for pride right now. Paul could have easily run away. But, you know, I never give up. And the Boston Celtics with the greatest fourth quarter comeback in NBA playoff history. <laughs> Something that's been on my mind for a couple of years. You know, all these things just come up again like it just happened yesterday. September 2002. The men accused of beating and stabbing Paul Pierce go before a judge and jury. You got to replay this incident all over again in your mind and like it just happened yesterday. William Ragland and Trevor Watson, both bodyguards for the rap group Made Men, were charged with armed assault with intent to murder, assault with a deadly weapon, and assault and battery. Anthony Hurston faced identical charges. They say he ran across the room and hit Paul with a bottle. He couldn't run if his life depended on it. The charges were largely based on one eyewitness account given to a grand jury, a woman who claimed to see both Ragland and Watson stabbing Paul Pierce. You have a case. You're prepared for the evidence to go in a certain way. And in this case, things changed substantially. The prosecution's star witness at first refused to answer any questions. When the judge warned her she'd be jailed for contempt of court, she fainted and was taken to the hospital. The following day, she changed her story. This woman came into open court knowing that she faced the possibility of a perjury charge before the grand jury, and yet she told a different story. She was not alone. Two other witnesses recanted their testimony as well. OK, and who was he fighting with, you know? He was fighting with a lot of men. Each witness described a chaotic brawl involving more than just three attackers. At the grand jury, this testimony was given within weeks of the incident. 
Now, where it's two years post-incident, any number of intervening things could have happened. Boston media questioned whether their lives had been threatened. Maybe the truth is that they lied then or got caught up in something and they want to clear the record. I didn't know anybody in the club, hadn't made any friends out in Boston, so it's like, you know, how, if I haven't made any friends, how have I made any enemies? He testified that he approached two women he did not know. Within seconds, an angry man told him one was his sister and punched him. And he was standing right next to these two women. Yeah. Out of the three, two of them I can recognize. You didn't see anybody with cornrows, is that right? Um, you didn't see any bald-headed guy, right? Um, and you didn't see anyone with real short hair, correct? <laughs> the only defendant he was asked specifically to identify was Tony Hurston. Right now, as I said today, I, I cannot tell if he was the person standing next to the pool table that I had an initial conversation with. On October 7th, William Raglan was found guilty of assault with a deadly weapon. Trevor Watson was convicted on the lesser assault and battery. Anthony Hurston was acquitted of all charges. If it wasn't Paul Pierce, you would have never read about this in the newspaper. This was just another barroom stabbing in the city of Boston, or could be New York, Chicago, or Altoona, Pennsylvania. It just happens. The truth about what happened that night may never be known. But the truth, who got a second chance, will never be forgotten. Paul is generous with his time and money to help Boston's underprivileged kids. As for his game, number 34 may yet find a home in the Fleet Center rafters. I haven't reached the top, but I'm still climbing.